Northeast Oil Recovery's future is going green. Please welcome Kevin Black. Thank you, James, and thank you, uh, Ron and Carrie, and the rest of the team at the Petroleum uh, Council for pulling off this conference. It's uh, really incredible to be together and to see so many familiar faces. I even see some NDSU green and gold down here in the front row with Dr. Kalk, so uh, you're making me feel right at home there, Brian. So I'm, I'm going to go ahead and say it and say goodbye to you. There we go. Uh, uh, like James said, my name is Kevin Black, and I'm one of the co-founders of Credence Energy Services. Uh, a family-founded company alongside my cousins Wyatt and Malachi Black, who are with us here today. And we're really thrilled to uh, unveil a, a brand new innovation that we've been working on for over a year called our C-STEM series of enhanced oil biosurfactants. <laughs> surfactants. Uh, we are uh, we're excited to share some data that we've never released before publicly, and we're going to share that at the end. Uh, but before I get too far, I want to acknowledge just a few people. Number one, Eric Nelson, our technical director, who has been really the champion at Credence for innovation and developing new chemistries. And then our partners in this entire journey, Locust Bio. Um, with us today is Martin Shumway, the, our, their, their technical director. Um, and it has been an incredible partnership of innovation and ideas to figure out how we, through chemical and hand soil recovery, can play a role in the future production. Of the Bakken. So before we dive into what this chemistry actually is, I think it's important to frame the conversation a bit and really contextualize why enhanced oil recovery is important moving forward. On the left hand side you see the typical Bakken decline curve. This is something uh, most of you are all very familiar with. It's a reality we have to deal with. What I think is really interesting is the graph on the right, which comes from Justin Crinkson and the Pipeline Authority uh, at, our, at the House Appropriations Committee in January. And to me, it's a very profound graph because it shows the history of North Dakota production from 2014 through January. And then what happens is there's a series of models of where production may go depending on the number of completions per month. And we see there's that magic number, number somewhere between 60 and 70 completions that we need to be doing per month to maintain our current production of about 1.2 million barrels per day. The reality is since about February, however, we've been hanging out somewhere between 30, 40, the numbers are, are still coming in, I think, on April, somewhere around maybe 50 completions per month. So um, in the absence of new completions technology and in the absence of enhanced oil recovery, um, it's not unreasonable to see where production may go between that 900,000 and a million barrels a day as we get three, four years out. So what does that mean? It creates an environment for replacing that lost production, yet we still face a lot of challenges, as uh, many of the senators and representatives alluded to at the earlier panel. Uh, we have uh, an issue with access to keep, uh, uh, capital, access to capital, right? And it's not just with the oil and gas industry, it's within the oil and gas industry. We have to recognize that in the Bakken, we are in competition every single day for capital with the Permian. The second thing is navigating new policies. Uh, we have a new administration. I'd love to take a quick poll on how everybody feels about that, uh, but I think I know the answer. Uh, but that means that you know we are facing new hurdles and new challenges with drilling and completing new wells. And then finally, we have this evolution of ESG, which has been creeping our way for a couple years. And the fact is that investors, whether uh, private, institutional, public, investors are demanding that companies in oil and gas embrace ESG initiatives. So we think through our biosurfactant technology, we can check a lot of these boxes. We're not talking about multi-million dollar refracts um, or very expensive EOR projects. We're talking about low CapEx treatments that can be ROI in less than 90 days. We're also talking about not drilling new wells or completing new wells. We're talking about re-stimulating existing wells, uh, wells that have been depleted uh, somewhere in the range of 100 uh, to 10 barrels per day. And then finally, which I think is really exciting, is the fact that this chemistry is a 100% clean, green, and sustainable product. I know that is a buzzword that gets overused all the time, but when we say biosurfactant, we mean it is actually biogenically synthesized, uh, manufactured with North Dakota agricultural products. And so we're able to literally create a sustainable chemistry solution for enhanced oil production. 
A little bit more about our journey here before I jump in. A little over a year ago, we started this partnership with Locus. We spent thousands of hours in the lab and in the field validating the technology. And we took it to the oil and gas research program back in December. For those of you who are familiar, there is a grant program through there. You first must go through though a very, very rigorous uh, technical review. Uh, we were very pleased that we got a seven to zero unanimous do recommend for a grant that went to the Industrial Commission, the Governor, the Attorney General, the Ag Commissioner, and they also unanimously approved this for just under a $250,000 grant to actually trial this chemistry right here in North Dakota. And that's what we're gonna share with you here today. So what is this? Uh, the chemical term for this surfactant is called the Sephora lipid. Again, the bio refers to the biogenic nature of the product. And one exciting part is uh, the fact that it falls into the class of what's called nano surfactants. Um, it is a very, very small molecule, so small it's actually smaller than the strand of human DNA. How do we apply it? It's very simple, actually. We essentially mix the chemistry with a, a pool of fresh water, and it is pumped down into the well bowl. It does not require special equipment. It doesn't require a huge footprint out of the location. We can simply put this away with a crack pump or a rig pump um, and to essentially squeeze it in to the, to the formation using a huff and puff technique. And then finally, what is the goal? The goal is quite simple. We're trying to get more oil out of the ground. We hear all the time about how can we move that needle? How do we crack that code and get that extra couple percent of oil out of the ground? Uh, we're not claiming this is the magic uh, bullet by any means, but we do believe this could play a very meaningful role in uh, turning that back. So how does surfactants work? Um, I, I, it's not lost to me that trying to do a chemistry lesson as opposed to happy hour is very dangerous, but I'm going to just really quickly tell you the, the, the 10,000 foot overview of surfactants. Um, and this isn't unique to just bio surfactants, this is also surfactants. The first thing we try to do in EOR is change the wettability of the rock. Um, there's a lot of different techniques, uh, contact angle modifiers. Um, that is exactly what we're doing here. When you change the wettability of the rock, you can mobilize more oil. Pretty simple. Our goal here is to water wet the formation. Uh, the best way to think of this is like rain mix, right? You go to the, the car wash, you put the rain mix on, or don't you? you know, it's always a debate I have with myself. But in this case, we want to use the rain mix in the oil field. And the, what the chemistry is doing is it's allowing us to water wet the formation so that just like when you apply the rain ice, when the rain hits your windshield, it beads up. We want the oil to beat up on the rock so it more easily mobilizes and flows to the well. The second thing, uh, this is just an example of how we can replicate this in the lab. Very quickly, this is called an amic cell. This is actually amic cell testing done with actual blocking core on our trial wells. And you can see we, we saturated the core with brine in the first uh, scenario. In the second scenario, we inject our chemistry. And you can just see with the color change in the brine, we're extracting more oil. We're actually able to measure this through the amic cell on the top left. Um, that is where we can measure amount, the amount of oil that's extracted from the rock just by changing the wettability. Um, and you can see here with wells A and wells B, which were actual wells that were used, that, that were simply simulated, we're able to extract them from 150 to 250% more oil off the rock. The second thing that factors do is they reduce the interfacial tension and the surface tension. Uh, what is interfacial tension? It's basically just the force that exists between two dissimilar fluids, in this case, oil and water. If we can reduce that surface or that interfacial tension, we can more readily mobilize the oil. And then finally, if we can reduce the surface tension for the reservoir engineers and engineers in the room, as you well know, then we can reduce the amount of capillary force that's required to mobilize the oil through the force base and back to the reservoir. Okay, chemistry lesson over. Um, what actually makes our surfactants different, our biosurfactants, than other surfactants used in this industry? Because they're used quite frequently. The first one is that our biosurfactants are much more com complex. There are much more uh, active sites on the chemistry, meaning that we can do much more or less, can, what, much more with less compared to the traditional alcohol epoxylates that are used in frac chemistries. Uh, the second really important part is that we've been able to prove both in the field and in the lab that our chemistry can absorb to that rock phase and desorb over time. Most surfactants, they go right down and they come right back up. We don't want to be a one-hit wonder in this case. We want a sustained effect, and that, that's what allows us to capture more oil off 
off the run. But if there's one slide that I definitely want you, uh, hopefully, to, to remember, it would be this one. I'm, I'm a very simple mind. Visuals mean everything to me. And in this case, this is a very, very powerful visual. Um, most fracture factors that are used um, are able to get into hydraulic uh, fracture. Uh, they're about 100 nanometers. But as you can see, their size simply does not allow them to get into the microneurs. Um, now, a couple years ago, a series of nano fracture factors were released. They're about 15 to 20 nanometers in size. Uh, and that's great, they could get into micropores, but what they could do is to get into the nanopores. And that's where I'll go back to the size of our molecules. The size of the credence biosurfactants are about 1.2 nanometers. That is incredibly small. As I said, human DNA is about 2.3 nanometers. It's a fun fact for your next family game of tri trivial pursuit. But it's important because of the graphs on the right, and that is the pore throat size distribution of the Bakken and the three forks. From where you're sitting, it's, it's probably very difficult to tell, but what is it showing is what is the distribution of the size of the pore throats? And what we see is that over 50% of the Bakken and even up to 75% of the three forks, the pore throat radius distribution is less than 20 nanometers. So really the magic of this chemistry is that we're able to penetrate further and deeper into the rock to mobilize more. So, this is uh, the first time we're, we're actually going to reveal some of this production data with the blessing of the operator. As I mentioned, you, you received uh, grant funding to do 11 stimulations, three one-mile laterals, three two-mile laterals, and five conventions. So far, we've done five of them. Um, we just did the two-milers, um, so we don't have data available yet for that, but we do have data on the one mile levels, and we think this is really exciting. Uh, this is a, this is well A, as I'll refer to it. It is on the eastern front of the Bakken. Uh, it is a uh, well that was drilled in 2008, one mile, and uh, th this is a logarithmic scale, but you know, if you remember back to that very first slide, definitely has the traditional steep Bakken decline curve. And really, for the last year, it has been flatlined at about 20 barrels a day and heading down a line. So at the beginning of April, we went out and we treated our very first biosurfactant treatment. And what you can see here is the production response. This well was treated with about 3,000 barrels of fresh water. So our initial expectation is we're gonna get a lot of water back. What's remarkable is we actually did. Uh, we are still returning after 30 days a lot of that initial treatment. Um, and in fact, we have uh, found that our oil to water ratio has increased. Um, we initially spiked over 70 barrels, which, you know, most people say, yeah, so what, no big deal. Um, but what we're excited about is we sustained about a 42 barrel a day right since then. We actually just got this last, this last week's data back a few moments ago. Um, and I'm happy to say we're right between that 30 and that 40 barrels a day. So what does that mean? We've increased production anywhere from 50 to 100%. Our goal is to sustain this production over the course of the year. Um, and provide an overall incremental oil production of 50% above the previous forecast, which was 20 barrels a day. Now here's what also is very exciting. If we do that, we will ROI this well two and a half times. Um, our moderate goal here is 50%. We've already, over the course of 12 months, our goal is to increase at 50%. We are already 25% of the way there in 30 days, which I think is pretty remarkable. Um, the second well that we, uh, that we stimulated a few days later, basically the same story. This well was drilled in 2009, again about 20 barrels a day. Um, and here we saw that same response. It is now leveling off, but again, this week we're right at a 30 to 40 barrel mark, and that's where we expect it to hang out as it goes back to the 20 barrel towards the end of the year. Um, and a conservative, very conservative goal of increasing at 25%, production, we're already 60% of the way in just 30 days. So as you can imagine, this operator is incredibly excited. They, they actually only took two of the trial wells initially. Uh, they immediately after seeing this response jumped on the third one, so we'll be putting the third job on the ground here uh, very shortly. So, okay, great, we can get a response. It will maybe last for a year is probably what you're asking yourself, but can we do it again? And the answer to that is yes, we believe we can. Uh, Locust has been doing these treatments for uh, three years now. This is an example from the Upper Devonian Sandstone Well in Pennsylvania. 
This was a well that was just about to be plugged and abandoned, down to about two barrels a day. Uh, the well was stimulated with the biopsy factor, jumped up to 12 barrels a day, and sustained a response for over 540 days, which is absolutely remarkable. Um, it was then re-stimulated, and that sustained response, and you can see a second time, has uh, held for now over a year. Um, of course, this is Pennsylvania, and that is Pennsylvania, and this is the Bach, and I get that. But we believe because of the poor throat size and the tight shell plate in the Bakken, there's true applicability and opportunity for this chemistry. Uh, this is another really important graph because what this does is it shows how by using EOR, and, and this actually came from that Devonian law, by using the chemical EOR and increasing the amount of oil we can recover, we can actually change the value of the estimated ultimate recovery and change the value of the asset, which we think is uh, probably pretty interesting to see. So we like, to, we like to dream big, we like to innovate at Credence, and we like to think about what could this be? And so what we did is, with the help of Justin Krinkstead, uh, we, we compiled the, the distribution of wells by production. And what we find, and this is kind of staggering to me, we now have over 15,000 wells that produce less than 100 girls a day. It's pretty remarkable, I don't think, that wasn't a number I was expecting or, or used to yet. We're used to, I used to having some of the bigger ones. But when you stack up all of those wells that are under 150 barrels a day, that represents about 670,000 barrels per day of production. So what if, what if we could just do these EOR stimulation treatments on those wells and increase it by, by 25%? Well, you can see we can increase production to over 840,000, that's what the map, this is just some back of the, back of the map came out. You can increase it 50%, you can get up closer to a million barrels a day, and so on and so forth. So, while this might not be the end all be all, we think it can play a meaningful role in increasing production here in the state of North Dakota. And then I'll just close with this one really fun and important fact. And as I mentioned earlier, the biosurfactants um, and really what, what Locust Bio has been able to do is to find a way to manufacture these products on scale so that they can be used in the oil field. This technology has been around for 20 years. It's been used in pharmaceuticals, it's been used in high-end skincare, but it's never been able to be fermented and produced on a mass scale that would make it economically viable for the oil field. Um, our goal here is if we can prove concept and if we can scale the project up, that in working with Locust Bio, we'll be able to actually manufacture this product right here in North Dakota. Um, it's, it's manufactured through a fermentation process, much like alcohol is, that might get some of you interested. Um, and it's two primary ingredients, ingredients are canola oil and sugar beets, two crops that we have an abundance of right here in North Dakota. So we believe that if we can scale this up, we can literally manufacture a bridge between oil and energy, which, uh, oil, excuse me, energy and agriculture. So, um, we're really excited about this. Uh, I agree, and I skimmed through a lot of the technical data, and I realize that. Um, so, we have a whole team at our booth, booth 415. Um, we'd love to, sh uh, to share more technical data with you and more of the results that we're seeing so far. But uh, thank you, James, and thank you to the Petroleum Council for the opportunity to speak to you. This is, this is amazing, um, just, just even on a conservative end. You know, I cited Ag during my intro because we've been very adept in this region at accelerating innovation and entrepreneurship. Do you see similar threads within the entrepreneurial community in the energy sector? And do you see that exponentially increasing over the next several years as a result of some of the external factors, perhaps, that Eric mentioned with respect to ESG, obviously the, uh, the ability to, to extract more oil, et cetera. So what's your perspective as an entrepreneur and where you think the energy innovation culture is heading? Um, I, I'm really grateful to say, I think, within the energy sector, we have a phenomenal entrepreneurial community. Um, can't thank Ron Ness enough for the invitation to testify in Hospital 1452 this year. I think our legislature took some really important steps to, you know, put our money where our mouth is and invest in entrepreneurs and invest in innovators. Um, and through bills like 1452, the LIFT program and other programs, um, it gives entrepreneurs the, the fuel to get these projects off the ground. And these are enormous lifts. This is uh, very complicated technology. 
and uh, initiating change is not always easy. And so having that capital, um, having the support, just having a stamp of approval from the North Dakota Industrial Commission to go out and do these trials uh, was, was really a game changer for us. So. Thank you, Kevin.